We all live in a digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust and to be trusted. We all despise control and desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. So we can start the session now. And OK, so good morning, everyone. I apologize for the delay. And uh, welcome to the IGF 2021 Workshop 29, FinTech, a sustainable development economy of inclusivity under the thematic track of economic and social inclusion and human rights. And today we will be focusing on financial technology, also known as FinTech, sustainability, digital financial inclusion, and youths. My name is Connie Siu. I'm a 20-year-old biomedical engineering student from the Chinese University of Hong Kong, and I'll be the moderator for today's session online from Hong Kong. I would also like to give a huge thank you to all the speakers who agreed to be panelists today, despite of the short notice. And so the rapid advances in digital technology has been transforming the world's economic and financial landscapes, in turn creating new opportunities, challenges and risks for consumers, financial institutions and regulators in the financial sectors. While fintech could help transform financial systems to become more efficient and competitive in broadening the access to financial services for underserved populations, there are also potential risks and problems. For example, fintech could result in the further widening of the wealth gap and digital divide due to the digital and financial literacy. Additionally, decentralized finance and other unregulated dimensions of fintech result in complications and further challenges or opportunities to promote digital financial inclusion and ensure that everyone has access to financial technologies. Since fintech is an area embodied with limitless potential, how can we ensure that the evolution of this realm is set on a good path towards a sustainable development economy? Therefore, today's session will be divided into three parts. We will begin with a speaker sharing session where our panelists will share their perspectives on fintech through the lens of their expertise all alongside their work. Then we will move on to discussion session where we will discuss opportunities and challenges for youth in fintech, governing the different sectors of financial technologies and pursuing sustainable digital finance and digital financial inclusion. I'm now honored to introduce to you the three panelists we have with us today. We have Ms. Veronica Savan, who is participating on site in Katowice. So Ms. Ver Ms. Veronica is a professional with over 15 years of experience, working intensively at the intersection of human rights, education, youth, new technologies, and digital governance. She has also been engaged in research, public policy, and project management initiatives, while consulting for various stakeholders, such as the Council of Europe, UN agencies, European Union bodies, and other international organizations. And their activities include contributions on youth and artificial intelligence, youth participation in internet governance, multi-stakeholder processes, developing media and digital competencies for educational and youth actors, understanding digital transformation impacts on civil society organizations, civic actors, and also social inclusion of young people. Then we have Ms. Nandini Charmi, who is joining us all the way from India. She is the Deputy Director and Fellow for ICT for Change, which is an India-based not-for-profit organization working to advance digital justice in the global south. Ms. Nandini's work largely focuses on research and policy advocacy in the domains of digital rights and development, gender-inclusive e-governance, and the political economy of women's rights in the information society. And we also have Dr. Agatha Ms. Ferrara joining us today. She is an international lawyer, advisor, and assistant professor at the Warsaw University of Technology. She acquired her legal education in several jurisdictions under common law and civil law systems and spent several years practicing finance law in leading financial centers, law firms, and investment banks. As an expert at the EU Blockchain Observatory and Forum, author of publications analyzing legal and regulatory challenges for the blockchain industry, and hold numerous advisory positions in the blockchain industry, she focuses on legal and regulatory challenges facing this industry. 
And before we move on with the workshop, a few words of housekeeping before we move on to the capacity sharing session. This workshop will last 19 minutes with around 14 minutes for the sharing session and around 30 minutes for the panel discussion. There will be a Q&A session in the last five to 15 minutes. And please leave your questions to the panelists in the Q&A window or the YouTube chat box. And also do indicate who the question is for or whether the question is for all the panelists in general. There are also English captions available by clicking on the closed captions button in Zoom. And for the panelists, I will most likely be addressing questions to a certain panelist, but please feel free to jump in any time if you have anything to add or if you have any further comments to the questions. And now, so without further ado, I'll begin this workshop with the capacity sharing session. And we also look forward to the questions that will be coming from you all. Each panelist with a, will have around 10 minutes for sharing. And I'm sure that everyone here is looking forward to the inputs from our panelists. And so let's start it off with Ms. Veronica Stefan. So Ms. Veronica, the stage is yours. Thank you. I don't know how technology works. <laughs> Good morning. Um, uh, thank you, Connie, for the invitation, and thank you to all of you. Just so you know, I'm also watching you on the screen, uh, on the smaller screen uh, in the Zoom room. Uh, well, so let's uh, let's start, and I think I'd like to start with a clarification. I'm not an expert on fintech or uh, financial inclusion at all. Uh, I do work on inclusion issues and uh, digital literacy a lot, so I think I will take that angle and I will also try to bring my own personal experience or of the context I work with. Uh, so I think whenever we talk about inclusion, first of all, we talk about exclusion and poverty most of the times. Uh, and in uh, starting from this premise, I think it's important to know while we talk a lot about technology and internet access, actually we're talking about a world who's living with multiple exclusions. So we are talking especially about the communities who are mostly affect, um, impacted of lack of access to technology, but also lack of access to energy and running water at the same time. And I'm speaking as a European. I am based in Romania. I work from Romania. I work in international context, but I do live in a country who, who has all these huge gaps. I live in a capital city who is comparable to Berlin, but then 40% of the same country actually lives uh, in rural areas. So the differences are quite, uh, quite important to have in mind. And um, while Financial inclusion and fintech in particular is dependent on access to technology. And in IGF context, in general, we talk a lot about the importance of access to internet. I think it's time to look a little bit more on what we do with the internet and what we do with technology. And that's why in general, I like to highlight the di digital skills dimension. Europe, uh, either it's the European Union or Europe as the regional, um, approach, let's say, wider Europe, we still have a huge issue. We have a huge, of course, internet coverage, but in terms of skills, more than 40% of the population doesn't have basic digital skills. How is that being translated in the end, right? It means that we are not really using technology for all the purposes we could have. Uh, and I will just share, you know, just two, two slides. It's nothing major, but I'm sharing them just to make a a point, right? Because it's a bit about my own country, but it's also about how Europe is uh, dealing with this. And it's always good to look at numbers, right? Because if I just tell you, and I uh, might speak just from my experience, I might look biased. And I always look at Eurostat. What happens uh, with all these people that are connected to the internet, right? 70-80% of people in Europe, but also in Romania, are connected to interest. I just take this uh, study case as a starting point, but what are they using it for? I think it's highly important to make this distinction, access versus use, or more specifically, meaningful use of internet. And specifically now, because we live in the middle of the pandemic, and we were living in lockdowns, and we are, of course, shocked by the impact of the lockdowns. At the same time, I think it's important to be aware that we were aware of these numbers. We just chose to ignore them at the same time. Uh, how were we using technology before? Well, definitely not to take an online course. Well, imagine what happened in the middle of a pandemic where everyone was to be was supposed to be uh, connected 100% of the time. So live sessions, working, learning, everything happened. Well, before the pandemic, in a country such as Romania, just 3% of all young people, or all people, sorry, 
took an online course, 3%. So basically that's nothing. Don't worry, in the EU it's about 10%. So again, it's still such a small proportion. But then I particularly put here, you know, like other issues such as social networks. We are all champions in using social networks. I also wonder what purpose for. But then I also put here internet banking, right? Uh, selling goods or services through online means, or uh, I don't know, watching video on demand on commercial services. So these are issues, right, that connect to financial issues, to how we use technology for financial and economic means. And the numbers are quite low. I mean, for me, they are close to nothing. And this is just for individuals. Then I also chose to look at what companies do, small and medium enterprises, how do they use technology? And then I put at the bottom there to let's say two categories in particular, and that is how companies are selling online and then how are they selling cross-border. And of course the numbers are both for Romania and for the EU. And again, this is Eurostat data, so it's reliable data that we can count on. Both in Romania and the European Union, these numbers are really, again, close to nothing. So these regions that speak so much about digital markets, digital economy, and actually, those stakeholders that are not necessarily the big companies don't really seem to make much use of these technologies. So you see there, SME selling online, 17%, both Romania, uh, sorry, uh, EU, but also Romania. Cross border than eight versus 6%. And just these will be the numbers I will share with you because I think these are numbers we have to keep in mind at the end of the day. Whenever we'll be speaking about technology, it's not technology in terms of access. I know that in the world, and I don't want to be hypocrite here, it's still a problem, and we still have to work on that. But it's a matter of where we put our priorities or what we consider priorities. Because we, if we'll just continue speaking about getting access and making affordable internet and technology, so like the device, the, the computer you use, the phone you use, but we don't put it together with the competencies you have. And it should be a package deal, right? You get a computer, you get a phone, you learn what to do with it. And you also learn how to do it safely. So it's not just a matter of knowing how to do. Uh, it's also being, and here is another key word we use a lot during these days, um, having trust in that technology, right? Uh, and these seem big words, and especially when we speak about emerging technologies, blockchains, artificial intelligence, which we are going to tackle today and during the whole week, but they come together. Uh, I work with young people, but I also work with seniors. I also try to do these intergenerational programs because at the end, if we just depend on the governments, maybe it's not enough. So let's uh, empower young people, these highly skilled, skilled or not skilled <laughs> citizens, but at least high users of technology to work with the others. The problem is they will have phones. They might not be connected to internet 100% of the time, and we should not ask that necessarily, but they will not trust using their phone to do any purchase. They are not uh, willing to use their phone to connect their credit card to it. And I'll be honest, I cannot advise them to do that. And I cannot even recommend a policy that would recommend such a thing either because they don't trust it and they don't know how to be sure in using that. So I think before talking about anything else, we have to put the emphasis on skills. And I know this is something we talk so much, but I think we really forgot to act on it. In the middle of a pandemic, I think we focus too much, and I have noticed it from kids to any kind of uh, social category, uh, equipping them with some sort of device, some sort of device and uh, some sort of uh, program that would keep them online 24 seven. But we never thought about all the other services that you could access in your time without being connected 24 seven at the same time. Uh, we didn't invest equally the time or the resources in the trainings that we could have done with the community. Uh, so it's not just about what you can do in schools or formal spaces, but what you can do in community programs that could equip seniors among others. So yeah, I think these are the points I want to bring to the table. And as I said, my background is in uh, inclusion literacy more than it's uh, in financial technology, but I think and there is going to be more space in seeing how the different, especially the new technologies can fit into this debate uh, and I will have more opinions <laughs> on that a bit later. Uh, Connie, this is it from my side for now.
Thank okay, you. thank you, Ms. Veronica, for your informative sharing with the statistics from the Eurostat of the European region and also the situation in Romania and also within the region with the challenges surrounding the digital divide. So thank you very much for that. And now we'll move on to uh, Ms. Nandini Charmi to talk about her situation in India and also about fintech, digital inclusion in India. Ms. Charmi, the stage is yours. Ms. Nandini Charmi, are you here with us? I hope uh, everyone can uh, hear me. Yes, we can. Yeah, so. And we have lost you. Hi, sorry, I think uh, I got like uh, knocked out of the room. Are you no able worries. to hear me? I'm sorry about this. Yes, we can hear yeah. you clearly now. Yes, so I'm like demonstrating the difficulties of access in, you know, reliable access in certain parts of the world, I think. So let me just like sc uh, screen share just one second. Yeah, I think you can all uh, see my screen right now. Uh, yeah. So uh, I just want to say that uh, Veronica reminded us about uh, one very important uh, challenge that it's important that uh, access to the internet does not become a buzzword and we don't think very glibly that just because connectivity has been provided automatically, all users are able to engage in empowering cultures of use. And this has been a very important de uh, debate since the times of the visits. Um, I would like to bring to the debate from my work at IT for Change, a Bangalore-based uh, organization from India, which is looking at questions of digital justice and promoting this through research and policy advocacy. I would like to bring to the question, uh, you know, the whole idea of how there is an entire hype about datafication today in every sector, whether it's health, whether it's uh, finance, whether it's education. We seem to have this automatic assumption that just if you throw some data infrastructure in it, automatically inclusion happens. And there are some critical concerns we have to be aware of in this regard. And I bring to you, before, you know, right now at this table, some experiences from India that we are currently undergoing. Um, I also want to mention that two of my colleagues are here today. Anuradha Ganapati and Tane Mahindru, who both look at different aspects of fintech in their research at IT for Change. And I'm also hoping that they can bring more experiences from India into the discussion that uh, follows. So uh, right now, I will be speaking about one particular policy initiative of the government of India, which is called the Account Aggregators uh, Initiative. So right now, we are all aware that there is a whole buzz in the a finance domain, particularly with respect to access to credit, that uh, a lot of reasons for the exclusion of low income households and medium, micro and small enterprises, it's traced to their lack of legacy documentation that will enable them to access loans, particularly in context in the South, like India, where informality is very high in the enterprises and trading and everything. For instance, if you look at the Indian context, 50.7 uh, million of the 63.4 million micro, small and medium enterprises in the country currently don't have access to formal lending channels. So we are talking about an exclusion of about 80% of the MSMEs. And so there is this entire bus and our central bank, the Reserve Bank of India, announced in September 2021 that it was going to set up this entire model called account aggregators to enable financial data sharing. This is a lot of jargon, right? What does it mean in practice? So you can look at what I have put in the slide, right? 
if you look at a small business that uh, seeks a loan from like let's say a financial institution it will have to furnish its bank statements goods and service tax returns annual income tax like results and you know its uh, turnover and everything as proof of its credit worthiness and if a loan application gets rejected by bank a the whole process will start again in plan b uh, in bank b and the costs of this go on and so on and so forth the idea is that an account aggregator i go to the next slide now it will act like a consent manager for the finance system where financial uh, users as and customers they can actually like give this consent manager permission to share their data with any other like financial information users who may be people they are seeking credit from or like personal finance management services from or insurance or any such thing so it's like an intermediary for financial data flows and the whole idea is that this business model of account aggregator will be incorporated as a non banking financial company and of course user data the personal data its anonymity will be guarded in a sacrosanct way because the account aggregator cannot like see the data and the account aggregator is in the words of the policy quote and quote data blind so this is the idea of what is like being proposed and some banks and some companies have already shown interest in this proposal but will this model actually result in financial inclusion will this whole buzz about unlocking finance data for access to credit really work out civil society in india is quite skeptical for a number of reasons so first and this again comes to the point veronica was talking about data poor individuals and businesses are at the risk of getting excluded again because they don't have enough data footprints right to kind of like justify these access to loans so it may reinforce existing exclusions uh secondly there is a, a, a fatal flaw in the model uh, that there is no imagination of how to meet the contact of financial information users of the customer data so that they are not engaging in customer profiling or market segmentation practices that will actually lead to collective harms so the whole imagination of this model is that individual controls for data sharing and anonymization are good enough and this really no attention to the evolution of a overall sectoral norm about the limits of user profiling in the financial domain and this is actually a very important concern because as you know india currently doesn't have a personal data protection legislation that is like strong and fully enacted and this is a problem now i come to the uh, next slide the uh, very big risk that uh, we have uh, in terms of like uh, the uh, the whole account aggregator model is that data infrastructure is likely to be monopolized by these account aggregators whose incentive is basically imagined as like a commission for every act of financial data sharing so if you sh uh, share more of your customers data you get to make more money as an account aggregator so isn't this at odds with the fiduciary responsibility of the duty of care towards users to ensure the data minimalism in sharing this has not been really thought about. about there is also the other risk that just like we have seen in lay railing or sex the uh, fintech account aggregator will become a platform monopoly and they will edge out competitors and then they are free to like kind of hold customers to ransom a lot of people foresee this risk and these the typical concerns that we have seen in other platformization and data business model that will haunt this sector as well and the essential infrastructure for financial data sharing for you know being included into formal lending that is essential data infrastructure is getting privatized without adequate safeguards posing the same kind of risks like in other sectors like e-commerce which we have already seen after amazon now i come to my final uh, set of like uh, uh, points uh there is a very big governance dilemma here which i want to like flag and i'm hoping for everyone here to weigh in on this 
Account aggregators are proposed to be regulated through self-regulatory organizations. And there is a collective of account aggregators called Sahmati, which is supposed to be like, you know, setting the rules for everyone about how they should be conducting their business and everything. So there is a classic network governance arrangement where the private parties who are providing this infrastructure and participating in it are seen as automatically providing themselves. Time and again, we have seen in the governance of digital public goods, whether it is the internet or whether it is other type of data public goods, such network governance arrangements have led to multi-stakeholderist capture and uh, capture by powerful private interests. So without like a benchmarking and like certain public norms how do we ensure that this datafication does not happen in ways that will paradoxically result in greater exclusion or co-option into a data fight market on highly exploitative terms uh, in the guise of like quote unquote financial inclusion? Uh, I just want to uh, end my comments here. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Nandini, for your sharing. It was very interesting to hear about your work at IT for Change, as well as presenting some of the risks, the models, and dilemmas within the fintech ecosystem. So if anyone has any questions uh, you would like to ask Ms. Nandini, feel free to put it down in the Q&A box or just directly ask her if you're live and also uh, put it in the chat box if you're watching on YouTube. And finally, last but not least, we have Ms. Agatha. So Ms. Agatha, the stage is yours. Um, hello, and uh, thank you very much for giving me the microphone. Uh, and um, thank you for my pretty test. Uh, uh, the panelists that spoke before me and uh, touched upon a lot of interesting uh, topics. <clears throat> Since the title of our session talks about sustainable development. I thought it would be uh, important to talk a little bit about what does that mean? Because sustainable development uh, has been very widely used and it's often evoked in variety of contexts, uh, political, legal, social, environmental, uh, and it really has been overly present uh, in recent times on a global arena of debates uh, about issues uh, most pressing to humanity. So the phrase sustainable development itself has really been overworked and it appears that it suits everyone regardless of the agenda. So it has been appropriated by governments, by NGOs alike, uh, and it's being advocated to promote both. Continuous growth, continuous economic growth, and the reverse of this unsustainable pattern um, of limitless growth. So it has potentially so many meanings that it may it risks really being meaningless. So it's important to reiterate what is that what does that mean and uh, what does it entail? Because the phrase itself is very ambiguous. It's really not far from defining logic itself. Because if you think of it, it's almost like an oxymoron. The development part of sustainable development stands for increase, for expansion, for extension, for seeking more. And in the world of finite uh, resources, this such infinite augmentation is not really sustainable. And the two words together, development and sustainable, uh, may seem contradictory. And I have studied this topic in quite a great length uh, during my PhD studies when I studied sustainable development and international investment. Um, and I understood that during the Industrial Re Revolution uh, from about the 18th century progress was, uh, progress was linked to economic growth and to material advancement. Uh, so in pursuit of maximization of economic growth, people saw it right to dominate and exploit uh, the nature. And industrial capitalism growing gap between poor and rich and unprecedented scale of exploitation of raw materials, materials led to increasing concerns about sustainability of this particular area of progress. So uh, from the two counter positions, uh, one promoting unlimited economic growth and the other warning of <clears throat> imminent disaster resulting from exceeding limits of exploitation of Earth resources, 
came a compromise proposition, uh, a growth that is sustainable. And at some point, the sustainable development concept entered a political uh, arena and rose to political prominence, gained new dimension. And that came with the 1987 uh, Brandtland Report, which uh, was a UN sponsored um, World Commission on Environment and Development Report. It's known as Brandtland Report. And it introduced a political dimension to this previously environmental concept. So, um, and, and it fits very nicely because sustainable development on a political arena fits very nicely into political sound. And, it's, and it sounds like something we all should approve of. And obviously one of the lar latest and the largest development in the area of sustainable development on a global scale was uh, the Agenda 2030. Uh, and this is when sustainable development goals merged with the development targets in one kind of common global initiative. And that's when sustainable development has, has become a flagship for the largest political initiative. And uh, it is it's such a vague concept that even the resolution itself recognizes that there are different approaches and visions and models and tools for, available for each country to define and uh, achieve sustainable development. However, the path to get uh, there uh, seems to rely on existing model, on existing model of pursuit of economic growth and the action, uh, the actions proposed in support of su such sustainability uh, kind of um, reinforce current pattern, pattern of human development. So for example, the sustainable development goals uh, call for protection of water ecosystems and uh, biodiversity of fish stock, for example, and at the same time set ambitious growth targets with regards to fishing on the other hand. This is just an example. Uh, so the economic growth still remains uh, the main global objective. Uh, since the 17th century model, uh, our since the 17th century, our economic model and social and political institutions have promoted a version of human flourishing and prosperity, which is synonymous or uh, concurrent with uh, growth of material wealth. So we are still on this seemingly unsustainable trajectory, and uh, we don't think we know how to get get off it. So that's why innovation, innovation is so crucial. And particularly, um, not that kind of innovation that just improves what we already have, that reinforces the patterns that humanity has followed, and that perfects our current unsustainable long term patterns and models. But the, the crucial innovation is the one that opens new possibilities and that has the potential to really redefine our existing societal and economic designs. And uh, blockchain in particular, since this is my area of expertise, it has this potential to go uh, to go beyond because it is challenging the core concepts of organizational matrix of many activities, uh, financial including. And in context of this kind of innovation, political and geographical borders and power divisions and separation of regulatory mandates, they become largely irrelevant. And this novel infrastructure fundamentally alters existing organizational and transactional patterns that defines uh, traditional jurisdictional boundaries. So it demands also broader perception, perception. It demands this uh, high level economy wide view on where, where we are as humanity and a fresh look at public policy objectives. And um, this technology has also brought an idea in financial kind of dimension, the idea of unified transactional space in which this infinite variety of economic claims and economic value can be traded and exchanges in, exchanged in this universally um, recognized digital form. So it literally renders the current um, approach uh, 
as a, uh, out, out of sync with, uh, with what we currently have. And this is a matter of principle and not a matter of degree. So um, lots of innovation that is now based on, on blockchain um, is, a, is a suitable uh, suitable technology to provide the mechanisms and tools uh, of, for ensuring many of the elements of sustainability. And that includes also financial dimension. So this technology is designed to support the objectives of transparency, of compliance, of accountability, and can be applied uh, to, by, by investors, by companies, by governments at all stages of uh, investment life cycle, for example, and to many, many processes. Uh, and several deficiencies in our current financial systems can be addressed through blockchain technology and its features of transparency, verifi ver um, verifiability and accountability. So blockchain can pave the way for this reliable and transparent, for example, financial accounting, record keeping, uh, auditing, uh, because immutable blockchain data records provide greater transparency and traceability for financial assets and transactions. It also enables ongoing monitoring of financial records and early detection of errors and fraudulent and corrupt activities. And corruption is recognized as a core problem of the current, for example, international investment reality. So mitigating this risk is crucial and would have help to meet, for example, target number 16 of the Sustainable Development Agenda, which is calling for reduction of corruption and bribery in all day forms. And those immutable and transparent financial records can be effective not only for detection of financial irregularities, but also can deter from corruptive activities. So uh, blockchain core features uh, enable to verify and authenticate identity, data, transactions, provenance, uh, and this is trust inducing. And someone, uh, a person before me was just talking about trust and, uh, and, and this is trust inducing and also reputation building. So uh, another thing that uh, would be quite crucial is uh, transparent and responsible supply chains that have been considered to form a key element of corporate social responsibility. So this is instrumental to meet sustainable development objectives as well. And blockchain is also well suited for these processes and financial processes that involve multiple parties who require little, who, who require little trust in each other. Uh, for example, fragmented supply chains. And it can greatly, greatly improve capacity of enterprises to integrate sustainability within the uh, supply chains and provide um, can be <clears throat> can be also uh, provide the tra tracking and monitoring mechanisms to provide instance instant traceability and identify uh, different um, multiple layers of the supply chains, for example. And a lot of this is linked to human and natural resource exploitation, environmental footprints and waste production. Uh, so um, the innovation could improve that sustainability on many, many levels. And uh, closely related with that transparency is also the issue of maintaining uh, minimum human rights, environmental and labor standards. So by adopting this um, transparent corporate governance, uh, co enterprises and investors, investors can provide real-time monitoring of compliance with all relevant standards and mechanisms for detection of potential breaches and infringements. Um, and the really the data on the region on the origin of materials and relevant certifications quality checks can be stored and distributed through the system and uh, can help align uh, corporate govern corporate governments governance um, with human rights with environmental and labor policies with uh, which are really the core criteria for legitimacy uh, so innovation has, um, there are a lot of opportunities through innovation to improve the sustainability uh, in, of especially financial system in many, many dimensions. 
such as financial accountability, business management, environmental resource management, uh, as well as social dimension, maintaining minimum human rights, labor standards, and collaborative dialogue with uh, relevant communities. And um, we can achieve many sustainability goals, uh, such as transparency, disclosure, um, compliance, stakeholder engagements through innovation. So the technology can, can encourage sustainable conduct, uh, deter corruption, improve sustainability of, of investment, and foster trust and confidence in really all level of uh, engagement. So in that sense, the, the innovation can correct some of the asymmetries of information that currently persist in our existing financial systems. And finally, uh, and I think we will be talking about this a little bit more, when we talk about this innovation and, and uh, sustainable development and inclusion, that is also a topic for our session today, we cannot forget uh, the, the unbanked and underbanked population, which um, there are so, so many people in that situation around the world. And innovation, financial innovation can correct that as well and bring um, this unbanked and underbanked population uh, into uh, financial services provision. So uh, on, on these many levels, I think we should not forget what is the, what should be the focus of sustainable development. We should not hijack that uh, concept for political gains. Uh, and uh, the, there is some innovation uh, nowadays that can really help us to redefine our current organizational, political, societal design to address a lot of the uh, uh, to address a lot of the problems which have caused us to have to talk about sustainable development in the first place. Who had the, the uh, some of the model characteristics of our systems that are taking us in, on this unsustainable path of um, economic growth and development. Uh, so I'm sure we come back to these topics uh, throughout this discussion, uh, but I give the microphone back to, to you, Connie. Thank you, Ms. Agatha, for your clarifications and insights on sustainable development and also emphasizing on the importance of innovation and reinforcements to improve existing models and also blockchain's potential in leveling the playing field in economy and sustainability. So thank you very much for that. And now just a huge thank you to all the panelists for your introductions and informative sharings on fintech as well as your experiences. So now let's kick off with the discussions and just a heads up, I'll be asking questions from a youth perspective. So it might not be as um, high level or professional. So let's begin with uh, Ms. Veronica. So just now Ms. Agatha has mentioned a lot about sustainable development. So I was wondering, how have countries in the European Union used financial technologies to address SDG issues and align their financial systems with SDGs? A heavy question. <laughs> uh, I'm not familiar with how all European unions are using technology uh, or financial systems for that matter, but I think um, what Agatha was talking about, these are hype discussions all over the world. Uh, and here I think it's a lot of discussion about uh, innovation, experimenting with technology and a lot of regulation of technology as well. I think they're all combined. Um, it's interesting that we do speak about these new technologies where I would like to draw the, let's say, fine line a little bit is that we are mostly talking about experimenting with these technologies, not a given or a fact that they will work on a large scale. I think even in the context of the SDGs, everything that is being discussed is the need and willingness to explore on different issues and different ways. Uh, I think even the uh, either we talk about blockchain or other new technologies, uh, it's always um, this assumption that we understand how these technologies work. And actually a huge discussion now is how to take out this discussion from the most technical communities or even entrepreneurial context to wider groups. It's not that easy to say that blockchain is not one way of working 
for technology, right? You have the bub public blockchains where things are closer to the Bitcoin model, right? <laughs> that we are always having in mind, but for all the others, it's not necessarily the same. So it might give you distrust because Agatha underlined it in any way, the discussion is always the same. New technologies build trust or are designed to increase the trust citizens have in these technologies or businesses have in this technology, right? To make sure that their product is certified, that uh, it, um, let's say it uh, goes a bit faster from uh, producer to consumer. So without all the intermediaries, we cut some expenses. But again, this is not a given. <laughs> we are still playing with these things. And there are some attempts, uh, inclusive, uh, including in the agriculture. So it, particularly for fisheries, for example, and all these very basic things uh, where producers can deliver their products to the consumers. But again, uh, from my experience and from what I know, these are just uh, trials and the struggle, it's, uh, I don't know, just the very beginnings. Maybe we can touch a little bit on regulation a little bit later because I think that should be a bit uh, separate. And by the way, just so you know, Connie, we also have a, a hand uh, in the room. And I think there was also a comment uh, in the chat, also for someone in the room. <laughs> Okay, thank you. As for the questions, we will keep it until the Q&A session. And okay, thank you, Ms. Veronica, for your response. And I was wondering, Ms. Nandini, is it a similar case for less developed regions or in India uh, with regard to uh, what Ms. Veronica has discussed about? Um, I see. Uh, I, I was just uh, thinking about this, that, for instance, if you look at the country that I come from, which is India, uh, right from the later 1960s and the early 1970s, there was a lot of like public policy intervention to build trust in the banking system. So uh, we have like, you know, this like extensive network of nationalized banks and region rural banks right up to the last mile. And there was like this big policy push for financial inclusion. But now we are seeing a move towards like, you know, the reprivatization of banks. That, that's the moment in the Indian context. And uh, there is actually a very interesting thing when I think about India that uh, India has done this highly unique thing. And in fact, I also read that even big tech companies in the US are petitioning the US government to do something similar, where the country actually made a digital payments infrastructure called unified payments interface, which means that across all digital wallets and everything, you have interoperable like payments architecture. So there is a public good that is created because payments transfer is seen as like a public service right and more recently the government has also intervened about market caps for like you know the private payment providers so that you don't have these payments monopolies which will then stop exploiting the con consumers so uh, what i want to add to what veronica said is i feel that uh, in the fintech space if you're talking about trust if you're talking about inclusion bringing back the role of public policy intervention because exactly like you know 20 years after Amazon we are realizing that Amazon could have run like a private like bookshop selling books that was okay but if it starts running the essential utility infrastructure that underpins the entirety of e-commerce that's a problem similarly in finance that's what we see and so this kind of policy intervention right from the get-go to kind of sandbox those like different like uh, play innovations and everything that's extremely important in developing countries uh, especially yeah okay thank you Ms. Nandini so um Ms. Agatha I wanted to uh, ask you about how so fintech has in a way lowered the entry bar for enjoying financial services but then it also imposes like a higher risk than traditional financial institutions so is there an overview of the regulatory direction that the regulators are setting in ensuring like a sound compliance among fintech products. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, sorry, can you can you repeat that uh, bit about the risk? I, I don't think I heard uh, the question entirely. Um, so the fintech connection. has 
Yeah, no problem. FinTech has lowered the entry bar for enjoying okay. financial services. So, mm -hmm. but then it also imposes a higher risk than traditional financial institutions. So is there an overview of the regulatory direction that mm -hmm. the regulators are setting in ensuring a sound compliance of FinTech products? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for this question, Connie. Uh, and I start with saying that uh, first of all, our global landscape of regulation is very diverse because uh, the way the legal and regulatory systems are built, they are divided into jurisdictions. And um, there is a very little cross um, in terms of fintech and in terms of new innovation. Um, there is not much of collaboration between those uh, jurisdictions. So there is a lot of diversity. And our traditional financial system, it has been built through this long, long process of evolution and this incremental change uh, that uh, kind of allowed to shape this, this, this financial system into what it is now through little steps, through a lot of compromise, through some uh, extraordinary, extraordinary events like financial crisis, for example. It also, uh, we also had a lot of time to develop certain perhaps more global uh, uh, principles and uh, rules. So our uh, current financial system is uh, more or less governed in a, in a quite seeming uh, kind of, in a, in a way that is unified let's say it's in the very general terms. Now, financial innovation and fintechs, uh, they uh, have been developing through a different kind of uh, development pattern. Instead of evolution, it's, it's more like a revolution. And uh, this has caught many regulators off guard and um, law can struggle, lawmakers and regulators struggle to keep up with that pace of development. So because of that, you can see a very diverse landscape of regulation across the world. There are many parts of the world that uh, regulators and authorities did not yet uh, start addressing some of this regulation. There is a regulatory void, let's call it this way, through different reasons, right? Either lack of capacity, other problems that many countries have to address first, so uh, lack of uh, lack of even uh, mandates, regulatory mandates to address some of the new products and services. So th this is one side of the spectrum when the regulators did nothing and uh, there is this kind of uncertainty as to how to apply the existing regulatory frameworks to new technologies and new services and uh, new products. And then you have on the other side of the spectrum, you, you have those um, jurisdictions which are very proactive and they are very proactive and they are interested in bringing technology, bring, bringing this industry into the, within their borders. So <clears throat> they come up with regulatory frameworks that are friendly and supportive. Not that many of those, uh, we can't uh, identify that many uh, regulations that would be that friendly. And then you have everything in between. So there is some uh, regulators that are on alert but have a wait and see approach and see what others do. There are some regulators which uh, out of, for different reasons are very prohibitive. So we can see that a lot of the innovation uh, at first, uh, the first kind of instinct of many regulators is to ban, to prohibit certain activities. And that works two ways. That either gives time for the regulators to assess this new development and address it adequately, but it also discourages uh, reg uh, innovation in this particular region and the innovation goes somewhere else. Because what we're talking about here is digital innovation and it's very portable uh, for the uh, innovators can quickly switch to different uh, region and they will be drawn into places where they are uh, the, the, the crunch is more friendly that allows them to, uh, to innovate and to experiment. Now, in terms of the pattern that is emerging, the first pattern that uh, can be observed is increasing regulatory activity and scrutiny. So what one year ago was still perhaps uh, there was a lot of silence from many parts of the world and about many of these new innovations. Now the debate is more live and active. So there is certainly uh, the, the innovation, especially particular type of innovation like blockchain, for example, arrived 
on regulatory agenda. And uh, we will see increasing regulatory activity. Now, the danger here is also that uh, because of many different uh, agendas and many different objectives that different regulatory uh, bodies have, we will see this piecemeal approach from across um, the globe with different regulatory responses to the same innovation. Uh, so that will work to uh, to disadvantage of many consumers, for example, that will create regulatory arbitrage opportunities. So, but th this is this is the process. This is this evolution of uh, regulatory approach. This a lot of it, this innovation is new. It's developing faster than any, than any regulator can keep up with. So it is a trial and error, and it's as much as the innovation has, needs time to mature. So the regulatory approaches will need time to mature and to define certain context, con, con, uh, concepts to understand very well what's happening. Um, so uh, this, is, this is a development, this is a work in progress. We can expect a lot of activities, uh, but we can also expect a lot of errors. And in the meantime, technology doesn't stop. Technology uh, develops very, very fast, at very fast pace. Uh, and the, the main themes of the existing regulatory approaches is first of all, consumer protection, anti-money laundering measures, counter financing terrorism measures. Uh, so these are like first things that our uh, regulators are concerned about and ma maintaining financial stability because some of these products and services are so profound that they have a uh, potential of really uh, changing uh, fundamentally our financial system. So a lot of the regulatory measures are aimed at preserving financial stability or preserving status quo, depending how you want to look at it. Thank you, Ms. Agatha. And speaking about regulation, uh, Ms. Veronica, I want to hear how you think about with so many different dimensions in fintech that are not well regulated or even not regulated at all. So what are the opportunities, challenges or risks of governing this sort of unregulated space, like cryptocurrency and all that, like from your opinion? <laughs> I was just mentioning that in Europe, this is a huge debate right now. And I think yes. uh, there is a high interest to create a safe uh, environment uh, in order to both experiment with these technologies as well to make sure uh, they serve the interests of citizens as well. So the public interest in a way. Um, well, we deal with different ways of regulating technologies because it's not one piece of law that regulates everything on the one hand, and also because I noticed that uh, uh, in the chat there were reflections on the use of data, regardless it's part of the blockchain or other instruments where they collect data and take decisions based on data. Uh, in Europe, we have at this moment uh, in debate uh, an act on artificial intelligence, another act on data, uh, so let's say blockchain is still not necessarily a part of this regulatory approach, but we do have different countries that have regulated it and are supporting it. Uh, and this connects also to one of your previous questions, like how are different countries using it? Uh, and I think it's uh, well known the case of Estonia that is using uh, such technologies in um, digital public services as well. So they do have a context both for uh, both for entrepreneurs but also for public stakeholders to to develop such um, such tools based on blockchain. Uh, I think we are still lagging behind with moving forward, I think, because um, especially central banks at some point expressed themselves against blockchain. I think we faced some steps back at some point. So, of course, initiatives kept going on, but then entrepreneurs in particular look for countries that offer them the space and legitimacy to do that. And in that way, I would agree with Agatha that you need that space. Uh, I would still keep my reservation in saying how well how useful all these applications are there are also entrepreneurs who say 
can I already use another technology? Is it more efficient? Is it uh, more efficient from a cost perspective, from an er energy perspective? So maybe not all uh, technologies have to be a bl uh, blockchain. You don't have to create all electronic registries through blockchain just for the sake of using that technology in case that technology is not necessarily useful at this moment. So that would be my take for the moment. Thank you, Ms. Veronica. And now moving on to Ms. Nandini, do you think there is any potential for such decentralized finance, such as cryptocurrency, to contribute and provide more opportunities in, pro in, in promoting digital financial inclusion? Or would you think that it would pose more challenges? Uh, I just have like uh, two points to make because uh, my area of uh, this such your expertise is not about uh, cryptocurrency or blockchain okay, no or like this kind of like intervention. Uh, but uh, listening to the debate, uh, one of the things that uh, I'm, I always wonder about is like when it comes to fiat money, there is an idea that as a medium of exchange, money is backed by a central bank, right? So when we are talking about unregulated private currencies and like, you know, decentralized currency markets, if that's what we are talking about when we are talking about cryptocurrency, what does it mean for financial stability? Because it deepens like the intersections between technologies and finance capitalism and what kind of like, you know, uh, risks that could pose for like economies that are not really strong. I feel that needs some thinking because because we also know, for instance, in India, the regulator is not pro like uh, decentralized, like, you know, non central bank controlled uh, currencies, like which are completely decentralized because of like uh, this uh, reason. The second question that I want to ask, and, you know, the, there is also like a reference that was like mentioned earlier that when we talk about cryptocurrencies or even blockchain as a technology, as just a ledger technology to keep record to maintain trust we are not really talking about just bitcoin i heard that mention earlier but i still wonder uh, when we think of like how these technologies work and the energy guzzling that they do for instance just like uh, two days ago uh, there was it's a piece that had come in one of the popular Indian media uh, about how uh, China, for instance, is looking at, uh, due to energy consumption concerns, is looking at like, you know, how not to, uh, you know, encourage or uh, uh, kind of like uh, tolerate uh, Bitcoin mining at particular scales. But, uh, you know, leaving aside that example, I would still uh, wonder uh, where that uh, leaves us uh, when we are thinking of blockchain, because there's always like, you know, this concern about uh, in digital technologies, uh, when the every next development comes, we should always be wary of greenwashing because we can't see like so many other environmental connections. This we see in many other things, including the internet. So what would be a different way to build blockchains, for instance? These are things I would like to hear from Ms. Agatha and other people in the room working on the issue. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Nandini. So, Ms. Agatha, would you like to respond? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, this is this is indeed a very intensive debate, and I am not sure if this is the right time or venue to go into into all these details. Uh, but uh, one of the things that Nandini was saying, it was talking about, was um, the fact that. Uh, currencies are backed by governments and if we are talking about alternative forms of currencies then what risks does it really pose and I, I agree with that concern and that concern is has been shared publicly in many debates however I would also like to point out to those regions around the world where those currencies backed by governments did not necessarily serve very well the population through political turmoils, economic turmoils, um, some other difficult situations that many countries find, find themselves where there is high inflation, where there is where the financial system is not effective uh, or does not work or doesn't reach uh, population uh, because of uh, underdevelopment, for example. So I think that we should be open to the opportunities that this kind of new uh, infrastructure, new um, 
services, new developments, and new forms of money come uh, come into play to serve the under underserved population, to perhaps um, uh, remove the question of money away from these political and economic turmoils that uh, many governments face and move that trust to technology, basically, move that reliability to technology through so many different forms that this technology allows. Because um, the, one of the great misconceptions about uh, blockchain is it is very much identified with Bitcoin, which is which is a myth, basically. It is the first application of this technology as we know it today. However, the flexibility and agility of this technology allows for so much more. And we can really configure it to serve the needs and to serve um, the particular objectives that we may have in mind. Uh, another, uh, another topic that Nandini kind of touched upon, and it's also publicly debated and is in focus, is. Um, environmental impact of a lot of the cryptocurrency and the energy consumption and i face that uh, a lot this question and as i for example teach in many universities and sometimes students come with these presentations for example about the econo economic impact and uh, environmental impact and i send them back to the library so to speak to, to research the the opposite argument and they they are always surprised to find out that there is two sides to this argument really in terms of in terms of economic consumption because you have to really look at it from the perspective of um, how much uh, energy is being consumed by our current financial system which is so uh, energy uh, demanding as well because of the way the system is built and overbuilt through uh, you know how many people work at that and how many buildings and how many machines and how many uh, you know how much energy in total the traditional financial system consumes so you have to always look at both sides of the argument and obviously there are ways of addressing uh, this issue through technology, but also through alternative energy sources as well. So I don't think we should limit ourselves um, because of this argument. We should look for solutions and you, we should see how we can address them with the tools that we currently have. Um, so I think it's uh, um, this technology is also obviously very challenging to the existing design, as I already mentioned before, to the existing design of a financial system and perhaps threatens a lot of the uh, currently established roles and uh, rules of the existing financial system. But we know that the existing financial system doesn't necessarily serve everybody very well. Uh, doesn't necessarily, you know, those who live in the first world countries have no concerns, everything works, but we have to look at, you know, wider at our globe and those areas where the financial system failed, uh, men, uh, lots of the population or haven't reached them yet. So as, as has already been mentioned earlier, they, people may not have bank account, but they have access to um, mobile phones and internet. Why don't we use this technology to, uh, to address a lot of the issues that, um, that we have? So this digital inclusion is very, very important uh, in, fi in, in financial dimension. The ability to create microeconomies through this technology is also very important because remote part of the world, people in the remote part of the world have little chance of um, benefiting from, uh, from financial development and financial products and services, but they have their own services and products in their microeconomies that they could you know, trade and that they could benefit from. So there are tools available now for them to, to be able to, uh, to participate in the economy rather than being left in the black uh, kind of section of the economy, under economy, so to speak. So uh, I would look for opportunities. Uh, I would look for, uh, for um, challenges but in, a, in this kind of hopeful and positive way of creating some change that would be beneficial basically.
Thank you, Ms. Agatha. And now due to a bit of time constraints, uh, we'll now move on to the Q&A session. And if anyone would like to raise their hand to ask their question, please feel free to do so. Uh, but we'll address some of the questions in the chat first. So for all the panelists, if you would like to answer the questions, just feel free to unmute yourself or and take the stage. So one Connie? of the questions... Yes. Connie, can we also take someone from the room? Ah, They're yes. waiting okay, patiently. Sure. OK, thank you, thank you. Okay, uh, hi everybody. First of all, I appreciate the nice hot debate. Uh, actually, it has been one of the most interesting debates so far. Uh, I've participated in IGF. Um, you know, historically, uh, I mean, at least uh, during past decades, uh, US and particularly the West Coast, let's say Silicon Valley has been the land of innovations, right? Uh, but I think uh, quite recently we have seen more and more uh, barriers in the U.S. territory for a new uh, innova for innovations, particularly in fintech and cryptocurrency. For example, a couple of years ago, uh, the U.S. authorities they tried to kill the Libra project of Facebook. I think they have been somehow successful, and. Uh, Later on, uh, the gram coming from Telegram, Durov Brothers, Durov Brothers, I think was uh, uh, put away, but they forced them to uh, stop it. So uh, my question is that, and as we have seen all, uh, just uh, again, some non-regulated or less regulated regions of the world, like Ecuador, uh, quite recently, they tried to be the motherland of Bitcoin, uh, for example. If you see, uh, uh, does this, uh, like, uh, uh, how uh, Agatha, Ms. Agatha has uh, put a, a very uh, good explanation of different regimes, regulation regimes uh, against uh, those uh, innovation in fintech. But I mean, if we see uh, that this uh, culture of, like, uh, conservatism, I let me call it conservatism against the innovations in fintech and cryptocurrency keep on in US. Does it mean that uh, we will, uh, we should wait, we should expect more innovations in the less regulated or non-regulated regions of the world? Thank you. I think this question was directed a little bit at me, so <clears throat> I will uh, try to answer that. And that's a, that's a very good question. I, I don't think anyone has the answer to that. And I don't know, actually, I'm not even sure if the authorities, uh, US authorities have clear answer to that themselves. I, I'm, I, I'm not sure if we are seeing a very coherent kind of strategy coming from different parts of the world, apart from the fact that certainly the scrutiny and the attempt to I would say capture and control this, this innovation, uh, these attempts have been increasing. Um, and this is due to many, many factors. One of them is the increasing um, importance of this regulation, of this innovation, the increasing values and levels of economic exchange that are happening in these networks. So this all brought the, this area into regulatory uh, attention. And uh, you mentioned Project Libra, and I'm very glad you did that because Project Libra, I think, is like is, has almost been like a catalyst for regulatory interest. So very, uh, and up, up until really the Libra announcement, this innovation has been largely uh, underestimated, dismissed by many authorities, uh, unnoticed. And then Project Libra happened. And we also have to be very clear as to what Project Libra uh, represents, because, you know, as I said, blockchain innovation so, is so diverse that when we think Libra, we really should forget about the word decentralization because it was a very centralized project. And the, the sheer scope of that project and potential implications really um, brought, the, brought this innovation into the attention of regulators. Unfortunately, I would say, because of projects like Libra, of which many authorities got really, really scared because this was the, the potential implications of the projects were immense and really very difficult to quantify even. And this kind of impacts, this, this approach by regulators to kind of uh, from zero to, from, from zero attention almost to all the attention, 
uh, in a way um, uh, contaminates the approach of regulators to this innovation in a broader sense. Because not every blockchain project is Libra project, not every blockchain project uh, has these potential implications and consequences. But yet, the the approach of the regulators ever since was the one of a little bit of a mistrust and uh, and warning signs and uh, all of this. So, to how is the situation gonna develop? Um, going to develop in the US, we we're going to see certainly more and more scrutiny, hopefully some uh, friendly framework frameworks where under which uh, innovation can, uh, can progress. But um, I'm sure that many blockchain projects uh, will be drawn into those parts of the world that where they are less constrained, where there is more room to experiment and more kind of friendly approach from the authorities. Thank you, Ms. Agatha. Uh, are there any questions on site? Are there any other questions? If not... Yes, okay. yes, one yes. more, one okay. more. Thank you. Hello. Um, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting presentation and discussion. Um, I actually have uh, one question. Uh, part of it I, uh, I asked already in the, in the chat. Um, during this discussion, you talked about uh, many topics, including uh, blockchain, including access to financial institutions and so on. Um, and I was wondering whether um, there were not maybe two uh, other topics that we could uh, also discuss. Of course, there isn't much time left, but uh, maybe in, in a few uh, minutes, uh, you will have some uh, input on that. Uh, the first one is that um, the last time that the European Central Bank uh, tried to estimate the cost of payments in the European Union, it concluded that it cost around 1% of GDP, which is quite enormous, especially when you think about the fact that there is this 0.7% uh, uh, of GDP pledge for aid development. Uh, and so I was wondering, in your different uh, national uh, contexts, uh, what the cost of payment uh, was and what kind of strategies were implemented, if any, to bring that cost down and maybe uh, help uh, use uh, that um, percent of GDP more efficiently. And the second topic, which uh, I thought maybe uh, would also be um, useful to, to discuss in this context is, um, when we talk about trust, uh, is also maybe the possibility or the um, uh, to invent a kind of new right, which is the right not to use any of these uh, technologies, especially since the feeling that there is some sort of coercion to use, uh, whether it is fintech or actually any other technology, even uh, on, on online learning or anything like that, um, these kind of public policies uh, might at times be felt as coercion. There are some reports that were made in France by the uh, uh, um, uh, retirement insurance on this topic. Uh, if you're interested, I can share a link, but I have no battery left, so it's a bit, uh, I don't know how we'll do that. Anyhow, uh, is it uh, not also um, uh, a possibility um, to um, think about this right not to be connected, not to use fintech technology uh, in order to bring that trust, especially when we know how many, um, for example, privacy uh, concerns there are uh, related to fintech and not just with cryptocurrencies. I uh, hope it wasn't too long. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we have two minutes left. So if any of the panelists would like to make a response, please keep it short. Thank you. Uh yeah, I would like to respond to the second point. I absolutely agree that, you know, making any kind of fintech technology mandatory by default is not a good thing. And that is the struggle that we are facing with account aggregators in India, where we are worried that would happen. Uh, and to an earlier question, I also want to say that in markets like India, where we do not have any right against profiling, uh, you will actually see a lot of like uh, egregious database like profiling of groups also happening. So perverse innovations, I think empirically, we are already seeing that and we fear that. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Nandini. So I assume we have around one minute left. So if any of the panelists would like to make a response, please do that now. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe just quickly on the payments and the cost of payments. Uh, that is probably very. Uh, that is a very good point, and that is um, very much what this technology could address uh, because of the cost of, especially international payments and transfers, is prohibitive 
for a lot of uh, for, for large part of the population apparently especially the ones that actually rely on foreign remittances remittances from from relatives for example and that has uh, no justification because the technology now is so developed that there is really no reason why those payments should take so long and be so expensive uh, there are regions like Europe which have created their own payment, uh, seamless payment infrastructure throughout Europe, uh, SEPA payment uh, target system, but others are not that advanced. So one of the major issues that we should look at addressing is the cost of payment, and this innovation is very suitable to address that, but also um, in some way this intermediates the current uh, services pro service providers like banks and other intermediaries that benefit from the current uh, system of international payments and so on. So this is um, very, very uh, interesting and important topics uh, and directly relevant to, you know, how individual in even most remote regions can benefit from that innovation and should. And they should have a right to benefit from that innovation. They should not be exploited by the current uh, really prohibitive system and not taken advantage by uh, financial institutions really at the end of the day. Thank you, Ms. Agatha. And now we've reached the end of our workshop again. Thank you very much for attending and huge thank you to the panelists for joining us today. And yep, so this is the end of the session. Thank you all very much.